Okay, welcome to the panel, Gender, Sexuality and Embodiment, um, Online and Offline, Affect and Materiality. Um, I am Dr. Laudan Rahbadi. I'm a political sociologist and assistant professor of sociology at the University of Amsterdam. And I chair this panel with uh, two great colleagues, uh, Mira Bosman and Dr. Julia Evolvi, who are not only panel coordinators, but also presenters. Um, so I will introduce the, the coordinators uh, when they present. Um, we will have four presentations today. I will introduce each presenter before uh, they speak. And um, yeah, we will have a discussion session at the end of the panel. Um, so yes, um, let's just um, move on with the program. Uh, the first presenter is uh, Dr. Shangwei Wu. And um, uh, Dr. Wu is a researcher of social media in the Department of Media and Communication at Erasmus University of Rotterdam. Um, and his research interests include dating apps and Chinese uh, internet. Um, the title of the presentation is Digitally Mediated Sexual Fields, Structures of Desire Hosted by Dating Apps for Chinese Gay Men. So I will give you the floor. You can share your presentation. Okay, so thank you very much, Nadan. Okay, uh, can you see the screen? Yes. Um, all right, so um, I'm sorry I changed the title last night because I realized that the title in the program is different from the one I sent to Ladan, um, but basically they mean the same thing. So it's about sexual fields, it's about structures, uh, structures of desire, uh, experienced by Chinese gay men uh, in their dating practices. Um, so I'll start. Um, I'll first start with a, a story. Um, so when I was uh, so when I was uh, back in 2014, um, I was traveling with two female uh, two female friends in southern France. And um, so when we were just walking when we were just walking on the street, so we played a small game. Um, so we so every time we see a man that walking towards us, so we would judge their desirability, their attractiveness. And then we will rate them, you know, on a scale of zero to ten, and give them a score for their attractiveness. Um, so the picture I show here um, is the cutest guy that we met that day um, in in Arles, in Arles, uh, in southern France. So my female friends and I, we both agree that he he's like um, at least a seven or seven point five or eight. So he's the cutest guy we found on the street of Ar Arles. Um, so uh, what I want to say here is that, so in our daily life, we always have this kind of experience, right? Like we discuss the attractiveness of, of, a, of, a, of a person with our friends, with people we know. And sometimes we have agreements, with, although sometimes we also have disagreements. But in general, we can see that um, there are like transpersonal values, valuations of attractive, attractiveness in our life. So basically, uh, we can agree um, in general, in a large extent, like we can agree that some people are attractive and some people are not. And um, so um, I guess you all have this, um, I think you all have experienced this. And um, um, so that means the attractiveness, uh, the judgment of attractiveness is not just some random thing that everyone has a very different opinion like that. There's some patterns in there and there's some agreement there. And another example of this is that um, sometimes we use the market, uh, market metaphors to describe uh, our perceived position, positions in, for instance, in, in the dating field um, or in the, intimate, uh, in the intimate field. Like sometimes people say, okay, I feel like I'm very popular on the dating market or I'm not. So people kind of perceive their um, uh, attractiveness uh, comparing to other people and, and assuming that the systematic uh, valuation of attractiveness, and um, so if we say, if, let's say, when we see a very attractive per a person, sometimes we say that we say that okay, this person has a very high, uh, like sexual capital, uh, right? Or, or if this person is not attractive, we say that he doesn't have much, he or she doesn't have much sexual capital. Um, well, um, so this is what the uh, the sexual field theory try to answer. So this theory concept, uh, conceptualized the highly structured systems of um, sexual stratifi stratification in our collective sexual life and try to answer questions about the, uh, desiring and being desired. 
Um, so speaking of this um, theory, there are several key concepts I would like to introduce first. So the first one is sexual capital, which I already briefly mentioned. Um, so uh, according to this theory, to the sexual field theory, uh, sexual capital can, come, uh, can have three components. So the first component is the appearance of the face and body. So this is very easy to understand. And the second component um, is um, the effective presentations. So surmised in gestural repertoires that communicate masculinity or uh, uh, femininity. And also the third uh, component is the social cultural style, which is often uh, reflected in dress and accessories that communicate race, class, gender, age, lifestyle, and sensibility. Um, uh, so we can imagine that because there are different components or different aspects of sexual capital, there can be different configurations of um, sexual capital. So for example, when we talk about the types, right, especially like in the gay community, like we talk about the types of, for instance, of bears, of twins, of daddy, you know, almost all these different types. So they actually refer to the different configuration of sexual capital. And then there's a concept, uh, uh, there's the concept of desire sorting, desire sorting. Um, so this, is, uh, this, uh, this concept refers to uh, the fact that each form of desire is a configuration of the interests in different dimension, such as the bodily and the affective dimension. And uh, in the process of a uh, desire sorting, so one person must decide not only how desirable another person is, but also how desirable, uh, also desirable in what sense. So for example, if, when we talk about a man uh, saying that he is a bo boyfriend material, um, so we have the expectation that he's also a very caring, he has a very caring um, personality and that, or maybe he's, um, he's, he's easy to, get along with. So it's, it's something more than uh, simply the appearance. So this is, um, so when we say that this, but this person is a boyfriend material, it means that we, he is uh, desirable uh, as a potential boyfriend. But um, in other cases, for example, like, um, uh, so people may think that also someone is, um, uh, people may think that someone is only beautiful or sexy or handsome and only, they, they probably think that they, they feel the sexual attraction, but they don't feel there's a romantic or attraction there. Um, yeah, so this is the, uh, the desire sorting, what desire sorting is about. So when we are on a specific side, so for example, when we are in a side like in your bar or in a spe spe uh, spe specific setting, uh, like a party or where we, may need, uh, where we might meet strangers, potential dates, for example, um, uh, on such a specific uh, site, the stronger the dominance of any particular desire, the simpler the desire sorting process can be. So for example, when, when gay men go to a gay sauna, where, uh, which is often a cruising place where people go there to have a casual sex with strangers. So the dominant um, desire you could say is the casual sex there. So the desire sorting process is simple. People don't think too much about finding a potential boyfriend, but instead they think about uh, finding a casual sex partner there. But you know, more complicated side, for instance, at a party, student party, for example, for college students. So students go there, they may find their schoolmates. And um, so they may think that someone is there as desirable. They probably would like to hook up, but whether to uh, whether they want to take this further, like to be boyfriends or girlfriends, uh, this will depend. So you could see that the desire sorting process is more um, uh, complicated in a different uh, in a side like this. And then speaking of the structure of desire, um, I think it also in, uh, entails two aspects. So one aspect is, is the transper uh, transpersonal valuations of desirability and the dominance of particular desire that coordinate the actor's expectations and practices. And um, so um, let's say a structure of desire it can establish a particular dominant currency of sexual capital in a given uh, sexual field and stratify the sexual uh, actors in hierarchies of, of desirability. Um, so that's uh, the features of, um, uh, that's what defines a structure of desire. Um, and 
after the after introducing the key concepts, I would like to talk about the uh, today's topic uh, of my presentation. So um, it is the sexual field experienced by urban Chinese gay men, gay users of dating apps. So I want um, I want to show how the sexual field uh, sexual field for urban Chinese gay men is like, and how it's shaped by technological, commercial, and regulatory forces. And um, so. Okay, so this study is based on um, uh, uh, 61 interviews with Chinese queer men with 58, uh, 58 of them self-identified as gay and the average age is 25.8 and most of them, basically all of them belong to uh, middle class and uh, they live in the first and second tier Chinese cities such as Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen. So those cities normally have a population of more than 10 million. So you could say that they're very urban and middle class and they have a relatively high social economic, uh, social economic status. And so participants told me that um, uh, they're using different uh, dating apps. So uh, the dating apps reported by them, uh, the, most, the most popular four dating apps are uh, listed here, as you can see in the screen. So there are one type of dating app that uh, on the left, like in, uh, including Blue and Grander. So this type of uh, uh, dating apps allow, allow users to start a conversation with anyone without getting a match. And on the right side, you can see another type of dating app such as Tinder and the Chinese dating app called Aloha. And this type of um, dating apps always uh, involves a matching mechanism, which means that users need to get a match first. And only after that, they can start a conversation with each other. And this techno uh, te technical difference will play a, play a big role in shaping the uh, uh, sexual fields uh, experienced by Chinese gay men, which I will elaborate later. And so the findings are, um, so let me introduce my findings now. Um, so when when the when my participants when they compare the dating apps, they were often comparing the user qualities of these apps. Um, so for example, there are uh, two concepts related to quality. So th there are Chinese concepts here. So one is called su zhi and the other one is zhi liang. So they are both the local experience uh, expressions uh, of uh, sexual capital. But they have different connotation here. Uh, so su zhi, um, su zhi means the innate and nurtured physical, psychological, intellectual, moral, and ideological qualities of human bodies and the conduct. So uh, it's a very Chinese um, uh, concept and it's all often related to concepts like civilization and the modernity. Um, so you could, you could see that it's actually more related to the spiritual quality of a person. Um, but meanwhile, there's a broader concept of co uh, quality there. So it's called zhi liang. Um, so zhi liang in the narrow sense, it means the quality of the appearance of one's face and face and body. Um, but in a broad sense, um, so in, in a broad sense, zhi liang is not only reflected in the appearance, but also in aspects such as age, education level, personality, hobbies, social network, and income. So you could say that it's an overall quality of a person. Um, so my participants, uh, according to my participants, the word zhi liang has the objectifying connotation that su zhi does not have. I think this is probably because the body, uh, one's face and a, a body is um, is, uh, is obviously um, involved uh, in the valuation of zhi liang, while su zhi doesn't, uh, doesn't, is not related to um, the body uh, or the appearance. Mm. Yeah, so these are the two different uh, concepts, folk concepts that I got from the interviews. Um, um, so I, I introduced the two concepts be here because they are all they are often they were often used by my participants and they were often used to compare uh, to compare the quality the different qualities of different dating apps. So uh, for example, my participants always uh, compared the Chinese, two Chinese apps with each other. One is Blue, the other is Aloha. So. Uh, say of, they often say that blue uh, has a lower user quality. So either su zhi and zhi liang uh, is much lower on blue than on aloha. And according to them, blue is more uh, is of uh, blue tends to afford 
immediate hookups and uh, and this kind of practices um, is often associated with the word low su zhi. Um, on the other hand, um, aloha uh, affords sexually inexplicit con connections, or in other words, people think that aloha is more serious and blued and is less used for uh, hookups. And so why they have different perceptions of the qualities of this, these two apps? So one important factor is the different design features. So Blued, um, it has the uh, distance sorted display of user profiles. So um, it allows people to have uh, to send messages to each other without a match. So in this case, a person don't have to have a, for instance, have a face picture in his profile and he can still send a picture to other people by private messaging. So normally some people you can see that if you log into Blue, you can see that lots of profiles showing in the interface. They are pictures of landscape or some objects, but not a person's face. Uh, because people know that they can send face pictures in pri uh, through private um, private messaging, and so this this technology this technological feature tend to attract people uh, who are less uh, certain about their sexuality, so who are uh, less willing to reveal their uh, their sexuality, and who want to have um, to want to hide their attraction to men, so they feel more. Uh, uh, discreet there, they feel like they can um, protect their privacy better on such an app. But Aloha is different because Aloha, uh, Aloha, uh, you, you need to match first to, to have a conversation. So if you don't have an attractive face picture, you can't get a match. So users of Aloha are normally the urban middle gay men who are very who are sure about, uh, who are confident in themselves, in their sexuality, who care less about the privacy and more willing to show their face. So you can see that there's a difference between the user groups there. And also the difference of user groups also come from, comes from the marketing strategies like Blued, uh, in, uh, from the very beginning, it aims to have a, to to attract as many users users as they can. So when they are doing the marketing, they also attracted um, users from smaller cities, smaller towns, and even rural areas. But Aloha from the beginning, so they are aimed at urban middle class gay men. So they didn't, uh, they didn't have many users from smaller cities, let's say, and, uh, and let alone rural gay men or rural queer men. So, so I'm that's sorry, why- Sorry, Shang Yeah. Sorry to intervene, but um, I just wanted to remind you that you're running out of time. So it would be great if you could uh, conclude. Okay, so, okay, so, um, uh, so that's the difference between the blue and Aloha. Um, uh, you could see that why the users have different percep perceptions of qualities of these different users. And um, um, well, um, I don't think I have time for this, but uh, I use one sentence to describe this. So people per perceive that Grinder and Tinder have also have higher, higher user quality because these apps can only be accessed by Chinese gay men who have access to uh, like uh, who have who can use VPN to access the uh, blocked apps like like them. So this kind of people normally they have higher uh, social economic status. So what I want to say is that you could see the uh, structures of desires are different in the sense that the one types of app tend to afford uh, sexual um, uh, tend to afford uh, hookups, while the other type of apps tend to afford the more lasting connection. And some apps are perceived to have higher um, some apps are per perceived to have um, users with uh, higher qualities, while others are not. So that's how the uh, structures of desire are experienced by Chinese gay men uh, that I have interviewed. So, um, so that's my presentation here today. Um, so I'm looking forward to the Q&A session so that we can discuss this more. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Shangwei, for this uh, great uh, presentation. Um, so yes, let's move on to the next presenter, um, who is uh, Nika Lohmann. Nika, you can already start uh, sharing your screen. Um, Nika is a PhD researcher at uh, Ghent University. Uh, they use a feminist anthropological research approach in their research in an ERC funded project, which is called Later in Life Intimacy, Women's Unruly Practices, Places and Representations. Nika's interests include studies of aging, queer studies and sexuality studies. Uh, Nika, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. 
Can you see my screen? Okay. Um, yes. So my project is actually on queer women's uh, later in life sexuality and intimacy in general, but today I will focus on uh, digital dating in particular. Um, and I will address a little bit of the background, but I think that Shangwe already introduced many interesting parts of online dating, so that's great. Um, and then I will focus more on the later in life digital dating for uh, queer women. So based on the interviews that I did in the past couple of weeks. And um, I use the term uh, queer women and queer people um, a bit interchangeably because um, this presentation today is uh, based on interviews with participants between the ages of 53 and 57. And they were trans women, but there was also one gender queer person. So it wouldn't really be right to say uh, trans women all the time because some of them went through some medical gender affirmation processes, but not all of them. Some of them only did that socially. And that's why I chose the term uh, queer women rather than uh, trans women in the title, because not all of them fit in that term. And also it leaves some room for their uh, sexuality because they're all looking for, uh, for women to date. They sometimes date men, but they don't really like that. So they, they are looking for women on the dating platforms. Um, so there are more and more older adults on digital dating platforms. And this term older adults refers to um, people between the ages of 40 and 60 often. So that can also be called uh, midlife. I didn't necessarily look for these age categories. I was looking for everybody above 50, but um, I just didn't find people older than 57 yet. So that's actually quite interesting, but um, that's just to say that I'm also open to people that are older than that, but they're not in this presentation today. Um, and I think that research on online dating really, when age comes into play, it's really about um, heterosexual and cisgender people. And that's the case in studies of aging in general, but also very much in uh, studies of dating and new relationships later in life. So that's also why I focus on this group of women, because I think it's very interesting to see what their experiences are. And women actually in general face harsher abuse norms than, uh, than men, and then also on digital dating platforms. And they're really encouraged to appear youthful and to appear sexually attractive uh, in, in that way. But there's also this, this idea that they shouldn't be too youthful and they shouldn't be too sexually attractive because then they are not dressing like their age anymore. So there's this balance of what they can do with, with appearing sexually attractive. And um, that's what makes digital dating apps also interesting because you're kind of advertising yourself to be um, a potential sexual partner or romantic partner. So it's, it's an interesting balance, I think. And then also when like ageism uh, combines with transphobia and cisnormativity, you get this very interesting or uh, problematic way of uh, being on uh, dating apps because the research also shows that not that many people want to date older people and not that many people want to date trans people. So it becomes a bit more difficult to, uh, to be on these dating apps. Um, but on the other hand, there is a lot of freedom also in the way that you present yourself. Um, so you make a lot of choices with how to present yourself with the pictures, but also the, the lighting in the pictures. And you can, of course, use filters. You can use Photoshop. You can do anything you want. Um, so you're also in charge of your presentation on this platform. So that seems to make it a bit more free to be on there. So it could be useful for people that are not considered attractive uh, by dominant ideas in society. Um, but on the other hand, like the options seem endless, but also when you are not considered attractive by dominant norms, it also becomes very, people are very discriminatory online and they say that it's personal preferences, but there are these, these structures in the app that make it difficult for some people to be on there. And that can also make it a bit more dangerous, of course, because trans women in particular also, um, they are often in, in very precarious situations when people are becoming violent and uh, things like that. So that's also not a very safe feeling to be on this platform. 
And yes, yeah, so my participants, they, um, they, they describe using the platform in a very laid back way. They often describe that they're on the couch and they're just swiping a bit to the left and a bit to the right. And they do that during commercial breaks or um, on lazy mornings when they're a bit hungover. Um, so actually they were not looking that actively for people to date. Um, they were curious and they would love to meet somebody, but they are not in a hurry because sometimes they came from very long marriages and they finally had some freedom. And so they didn't want to have that pressure either. Um, and also they didn't really like the people on the platform. So that made it a bit less motivating to be on the platform all the time. And also COVID made it a bit impossible for, for them to date in the past couple of months, of course. So they hadn't really been active that much, um, but they did also have a lot of experiences on the app. So we talked a lot about that during the interviews. Um, and it was interesting because they approached the settings in very different ways, um, but also they were very similar in some senses. So um, when, it when it came to their age, they were very, they had a very uh, common idea of what you should do because um, their own age, they didn't want to date people older than that, so that's where the higher age bar was. And then um, their, their lower age bar was mostly like 15 or 20 years younger because they also had to have a big pool of matches because if they had a very small uh, range, they would not meet anybody and they would be out of potential partners very quickly. Um, and then also some of them like considered putting a different birth year in their account, so one woman said that, yeah, you can do that, but then you're fooling yourself when you do that. Because when you want to start a more serious relationship with somebody, do you really want that to be the first thing to confess? And she said, I have enough to confess in the second stage in the relationship anyway. And she laughed. Um, so they all mentioned that they do use their own age because they find it necessary, but they only do it when the platform requires you to do that. So if they were on other platforms for dating, they would never do that and they would just leave their age out because it would be better because they also realized that not that many people include their age in their searches so they are left out of a lot of uh, platform of a, of a lot of um, people accounts so they didn't really have that many people to pick from actually and also um, their uh, sexual orientation made their pool a bit smaller already because they were in the category of women and they were looking for women so that pool was already smaller and that made it a bit more difficult uh, to look for people but they did feel more safe with women so they would uh, only look for women because they knew they were going to be more accepting of their uh, gender and also they found women more attractive so that was also very important of course um, and sometimes very sometimes they would look for men they would open up their profile but they wouldn't have any matches so then they just turned it back to women only because it was too uh, disappointing and actually there was one person uh, the gender queer person who had two profiles so there was one uh, boy profile and one uh, female one and, um, and the female one was very glamorous very um, very nice outfits a lot of makeup and um, she wouldn't get any matches uh, with that account with men because um, that was just not something that men liked apparently. So then uh, she would go back to uh, only the, the women because that was her target audience. And she knew that, that it would be better for her. And um, yeah, so when I, when I asked, do you also go on dates then in this very feminine, very glamorous apparel? And then she said, Yes, because that would seem uh, quote unquote fair, uh, because I look like this on the profile, then I also have to go on the date like this. Um, but also they didn't re really do that all the time because then they would also consider the safety of the, the place where they would go to have the date. And if this was some place that wouldn't really allow for uh, people to be super glamorous and wearing glitter and fancy dresses, then they wouldn't do that because that would also be causing for uh, uns unsafe situations. Um, but this whole uh, desire to, to 
appear like the profile or make the profile look like uh, you. That was really felt by other participants as well. Um, so they actually really refused to use any Photoshop or uh, filters because they wanted their profile to be as honest or as uh, similar to real life as possible. And um, actually, they also said that filters are for young people. <clears throat> so filters is not something that they consider attractive. And if they see other older people using these uh, Instagram filters or Snapchat filters, they really don't find it attractive because that's not something you do when you are in your 50s, uh, they thought. So actually, they use pictures that also show that they're aging, like they wouldn't uh, use Photoshop to get rid of their wrinkles or uh, gray hairs because they also find it attractive, especially the people that look a bit more androgynous. Um, and they didn't find it unattractive to see people that had a, a body that was aging a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, so they want to appear like they do in real life, but also on their own terms. So there were some things that they would uh, never show, uh, like their hairlines. If they're receding, they would never show that because that's not something that they uh, find attractive about themselves. So they would wear hats and uh, wigs for that. So that's where you see that they still have this uh, freedom of, of what they can show and, uh, and, and what they won't show because they don't like it. And then, oh, yes. So many uh, dating profiles also have this uh, option for putting your gender in there. And I think that some of the dating platforms are also considered, um, uh, they are praised for that or they're, they're, that's a good thing, but they really didn't think it's a good thing because they really felt like if they do that, then people will fetishize me and will come after me. And that just doesn't feel safe. Um, and also um, some, some people said that, yeah, it's also this context that I grew up in. So they really said that, yeah, I am just from a gen different generation than you are. Um, so I carry a bit of shame around my gender identity. So I don't want to put it on my profile because it's not something uh, that you talk about. It's something that you keep um, out of the spotlight a little bit. And they would tell it, but they would do it later. So, yes. Mm. I think that's <clears throat> um, what, what I saw is that they really wanted to go through the whole dating process very quickly. So they made very clear profiles saying what they want and what they don't want um, because they didn't want to wait. Like they didn't want to wait to figure out how the other person is and if they're going to uh, match. So they would be very clear in that. So they wouldn't want to lose time getting to know the other person. But on the other hand, they also wanted to take it slow because they had to, um, they felt like they had to tell the other person at some point that they have this um, trans, uh, trans identity or this trans past and trans experience. So they would also take it slow with, in that regard. And they would try to find the right moment to tell the other person about this. And this was really stressful sometimes because you don't know if the other person is going to be okay with that. And you don't know what is the right moment and when are you going to tell that in the conversation. Maybe you do it online or maybe you do it offline. So they really had the biggest struggle uh, in, in that. So time was a big, big element in that. Um, and then other people were also getting a bit mad at them sometimes, like uh, asking them if they couldn't be, have been honest, if they couldn't have said it earlier, like saying that they wasted their time, which seemed really unfair because, well, the conversation is between two people, of course. And that's, that's their, their biggest hurdle in the platform. Um, so it does seem to give like more freedom and more choices to pick the right moment than if you meet online. But on the other hand, if you meet offline, then you will immediately know if the other person is an okay person. So they will really would prefer to meet people offline, actually, despite all the options in the, the dating platforms. So when it comes to uh, self-representation and um, the categories, they really seem to close many possibilities because people, if they see the word trans, they don't match 
uh, with with the person because they seem to um, base their reaction on stereotypes that they have in their head and people describe that they get no matches at all when they do that um, but the pictures if they just use the pictures to show themselves they um, they still get matches and people um, they they uh, they take the time to get to know the other person and then uh, it gives them a lot more possibilities to to navigate the dating platform um, and that's just to say that this their dating experiences are definitely not only uh, negative they have a lot of good experiences and they get a lot of uh, great matches too and they do go on on dates and there is this desire to uh, transgress the ex existing norms uh, so they are kind of already challenging uh, the ideas of what is considered attractive and what is considered desirable because uh, they really push back against these ageist uh, stereotypes as well uh, by appearing androgynous and really liking that or by appearing super feminine and other people like that as well. So uh, that's, that's really already challenging some of these norms on the dating platform itself. Um, so yeah, they're already challenging this idea of who is considered attractive and um, who is considered dateable uh, because they are older people and they are trans people and they are dating. So that's, uh, that's something very positive, I think. And um, I think that's, I'll leave it at this and we can continue talking in the Q&A and I'm looking yeah. forward to the other ones. Yes, thank you very much, Nika, for this fascinating uh, presentation. I thought there were um, interesting connections to Shang Wei's uh, presentation as well, to which we can return in the discussion. So um, I would like to immediately uh, go to Mira, who's our next presenter. Mira, you can already uh, share your uh, screen with us. Um, Mira Bosman is a PhD candidate in anthropology and sociology at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, her doctoral research focuses on uh, heteronormativity and heterosexual sex practices in the Netherlands and is based on interviews with um, man-woman couples, the analysis of a large online forum, and a study of a reality TV series on sex education for um, adults. Uh, Mira, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you for your introduction. Uh, quickly, before I start, um, I want to say that um, originally I signed up for the panel on embodiments. And that panel merged with the other panel, so I'm a little bit the odd one out because um, I'm not talking about online environments, I'm going to talk about offline sex. Um, and also I'm really focusing on embodiment. Um, so yes, indeed, um, this presentation is about the interview study about heterosexual sex. Um, I interviewed 34 Dutch women and men, uh, so 17 couples in a heterosexual relationship. Um, and I'm going to present some findings about um, their embodied experiences of sexual pleasure, and particularly their embodied knowledge. Um, so embodiment is unfortunately um, not so very well researched within sociology, and there's less of a focus on embodiment, and um, that's one of the reasons for really my dependence on this. And this is also the case in sexuality studies to a certain extent. So, for instance, Ken Plummer um, explains that those sociologists who have studied sexuality have generally focused on more as a script, a discourse, a power strategy, or an identity, and only rarely as a body, body project or embodiment. And I would say that this is specifically the case for heterosexual sex. Um, and in an overview article uh, on research about sexuality and embodiment, Tom Bowman and Thomas conclude that ironically, the vast majority of sexuality research does not have much sex in it. What people actually do think and feel when expressing sexual feelings or use their bodies in sexual ways is rare. Sexuality research is for the most part more sanitized than the messiness of actual sex. So in my research, I'm very much interested in this messiness of actual sex and all the feelings and sensations uh, that are part of this. And when I talk about sex, I'm, I use a really broad definition. So I'm talking about any erotic activity. And when I'm talking about sexual pleasure, which I will be talking about a lot here, um, I just follow the descriptions of my participants. So whatever they experience as, um, as pleasurable, I'm really trying to move away from these codified terms like orgasm, arousal, and desire, 
that uh, sex research focuses on, um, for instance, from a medical perspective. So in this paper that I wrote, I hope to address both sociologists uh, who are not studying sex and sexuality scholars, and I have two aims. I'm hoping to broaden our understanding of sexual pleasure, um, and I'm using novel elicitation techniques that I will explain uh, later on to really get an understanding of what is experienced as pleasurable. And I'm also taking sexual pleasures as a case to study how embodied experiences are forms of knowledge and drivers of social practices. So here I'm kind of moving away from sex research and I'm moving towards sociology of the body. Um, when I say, sorry, when I say um, embodied knowledge and know-how, I'm, I'm referring to this kind of practical, pre-reflexive, often non-discursive kind of knowledge uh, that is known through the body and by the body. Um, so you know how to move your body in certain ways. So for instance, um, if you think of the example of kissing, um, you know how to kiss, you know how to do it slowly, you know how to do it more eagerly. And this is the kind of, um, um, yeah, you know this through your body and by your body. It's not like a, you think about this all the time or you verbalize it necessarily. So this is what I mean by this embodied knowledge. Um, so in this article, I'm interested in how partners co-produce embodied knowledge about and sexual pleasures and how this informs habitual and in, improvised continuous interactions. Um, and I'm, I'm going to argue that sexual pleasure is a collective and learned and dynamic process and that as sex researchers we should pay more attention to this. Um, and I apply the concept of body techniques um, um, to analyze how partners um, gain this embodied knowledge and how it produces sexual pleasures. And body techniques is a concept um, um, coined by Moss uh, uh, way back in 1934, um, because when he took part in World War uh, I, he observed that British and French soldiers moved their bodies in different ways while digging and running. And he reasoned like, okay, this biological makeup cannot explain this alone. Uh, so this is a learned and culturally dependent behavior that he was witnessing. And this led him to write an essay on this. Uh, so body techniques are acquired abilities that embody knowledge and understanding, and people collectively know how to use their bodies. Moss, uh, in this paper that he wrote, uh, also refers to sexual acts. And so far, uh, to my knowledge, um, no sex researcher has actually taken up this uh, idea of, of, of concept of body techniques to study sexual uh, interactions. This, um, unfortunately, the body techniques um, focus a bit less on emotions, whereas sex is, of course, fueled by emotions. Um, so I'm referring to Collins in my paper, Collins' idea of emotional energy uh, that is generated through interactions to also take, um, uh, take this into account. So the study, I'm going to talk about this very briefly. Um, I interviewed these um, 34 Dutch women and men. Uh, 17 couples, I interviewed them together and um, apart. And um, yeah, the interviews covered all kinds of topics. I talked about their sexual interactions, their sensations, their ways of communicating. Um, but I here specifically focus on these two elicitation techniques that I mentioned before. Because I thought beforehand, uh, of course, it's difficult to verbalize embodied sensations. Um, and so I came up with two kind of practical assignments. The one um, is a um, kind of task uh, during the second joint interview. And I asked partners to describe uh, their ways of touching and feeling. So the one partner would describe what they're doing, and the other one would describe what they're feeling. And then swapped around. I can talk more about this maybe in the question section. Um, and then I also use uh, body mapping. Um, Existing technique, I just adapted it a bit to this particular research. And this I did during the um, joint, uh, the final individual interview. So I gave this body map, uh, the contours of a, of a drawing of a kind of gender neutral body to my respondents. And then I asked, could you indicate where do you like to be touched? Or do you touch yourself sexually? Where do you feel the effects of this in your body? Um, and this is Eric who circled with his little dots. Of course, these are all tools 
uh, to get people to talk about their sensations. So literally bring back uh, the body into research and they're not a means in themselves or an end in themselves. Um, okay, so now moving on to the findings. I'm going to present four uh, slides with findings. And first of all, I was interested in how people acquire embodied knowledge. Um, and I found two ways in which my participants do that. On, a, on the one hand, imitation is important. So they watch, they closely observe or carefully observe how their partner touches themselves during a sexual encounter. And then they mimic this behavior. And of course, what they mimic is not just the touch, but it's also um, the intention of generating uh, sexual pleasure. And this, of course, requires uh, a kind of trial and error. So linked to this is the trial and error. They try out certain things and they get a, re a reaction from their, um, from their partner, such as was the case with Sarah and Patrick. Um, they're describing how Patrick likes Sarah to bite his nipple. And Sarah is here explaining how this required her to kind of try, try it out. So she's saying, well, I have to be careful because it once happened that I accidentally, but you said harder, harder, she's laughing, and then I bit just a bit too hard, and then it was like, oh, oh no, stop. And the arousal really disappeared because it really did hurt. But this hasn't happened recently. To which Patrick replies, no, not recently, because we know each other's body really well. And Sarah says, yes, exactly, I know exactly what you like and how hard I should find. So this is what I mean with this kind of embodied knowledge and know-how. So Sarah uses uh, Patrick's painful reaction to fine-tune her own practices, and it's this practical embodied knowledge uh, that informs her body, bodily know-how, so knowing how to move your body. And she applies this to future interactions. That's why it doesn't happen anymore if she wants to have. So here we also see that it's a kind of collective endeavor, uh, endeavor this, this sexual pleasure, um, and partners really show to be emotionally invested uh, into learning about each other's experiences to acquire this uh, embodied knowledge. Okay, we're going to the second finding. So what is of course very interesting about sex is that the same way of touching uh, may feel differently at different moments. So this means that this embodied knowledge that the partners have about each other is very dynamic. Um, and this um, uh, dynamic aspect is, is incorporated in how they talk about their sexual experiences or is visible in how they talk about their sexual encounters. So this is Bert, and this is during this assignment that I was talking about before, where, where partners are describing where they touch each other and how this feels. So this is Bert uh, starting off by saying, um, yes, how I touch, they can really differ. It happens quite intuitively. When I feel it, you're a bit tense, so he's now turning to tell. Then I just say, go lay in your belly, and then I just stroke your back very gently. And sometimes I massage your back a bit when it gets really tense. It also happens that we look each other in the eye while I'm stroking you, and it's the same for your breasts as with your vagina. Sarah doesn't mind when you stimulate her if she's not aroused. It's not pleasant for me. So here we see uh, three things. We see that Bert drew on his uh, accumulated embodied knowledge to sum up a variety of scenarios for interpreting and responding to Sarah's embodied experiences. Um, and he relies on bodily signals, uh, such as these tense muscles, to feel what Tara is experiencing. And then he bases his actions on uh, previous experiences that guide him what he calls intuitively to do what Tara uh, likely finds pleasurable. So again, we see that this uh, pleasure is a really collective uh, act. It's not an individual process. Um, it's an investment in a social bond as well. So through pleasuring each other, uh, is a means, pleasuring each other is a means to establish and enact an emotional bond. Uh, and that's why partners are also willing to do this kind of work. The third uh, finding that I'm going to uh, talk about is how embodied pleasures inform interactions. And on the one hand, this is, this is of course kind of obvious if you're thinking about consensual uh, uh, sex interactions in, in, for instance, committed relationships. So I'm not going to talk about the obvious, uh, but I will uh, discuss something that is, uh, that is discuss, uh, discussed less often. And that is how haptic experiences, that is touching and being touched, 
uh, generate emotional energy. And this is experienced as pleasurable. So I'm going to provide an example by Jeffrey and Kristen. Jeffrey um, is, is talking about um, how he remembers sexual encounters during which we didn't touch each other so much. And I really miss that. And that's because maybe this is the same for you, said Kristen, then it feels a bit technical and clinical. Kristen agrees. And it's the touches that make it tender or rougher and more eager. There's a certain mood in Dutch humor expressed through ways of touching. And Kirsten says, yes, hence, of course, speak an important language. So this back and forth touching that they describe here, that they refer to, uh, creates a shared mood. And this is only possible because partners know how to touch each other and how to in interpret the ways of touching uh, of their partner as well. So they're really co-producing this pleasure through their touches. Um, and the emotional energy that is accompanied by. So I'm now going to the fourth and final uh, uh, finding that I'm going to present in this presentation. Uh, and I'm going to talk about playful interactions. Because also during playful uh, kind of interactions, um, touching is very important, but then it's the postponing of touching um, that is, that is the kind of way of, kind of uh, pleasure is. Um, so again, it's an important way to reach use their body and bodily movements to create and enact a certain pleasurable mood. Um, so I'm going to give the example of Tim and Patty. So Tim is saying, if you want a good response, and you've got, then you've got to stimulate her choice and then continue or to tease her by not touching it, but just to stroke up her legs to her clitoris without actually reaching it. Patty says, I find teasing really frustrating, which frustrating good way. I then think, where is he going? Will he go inside with his fingers or stimulate my clitoris? And yes, my clitoris is really pleasurable. He knows exactly where it is. And stimulating my clitoris causes a little shock throughout my body. So I was saying earlier that I was hoping to broaden kind of the understanding of, of sexual pleasure. And I think Patty here gives a good example because she explains that frustration can actually be pleasurable and it's for many people not the first thing they think about um, uh, when they think of sex. So again, um, based on their embodied knowledge about each other's likes and dislikes, partners are able to play with each other's pleasures. They're playing with each other's uh, um, uh, expectations and you need this embodied knowledge and know how to be able to do that. Play simultaneously is also an important means to expand embodied knowledge to try out and discover new ways of touching, which may also become habitual over time. So to conclude, um, I hope that, it, that I made clear that sexual pleasure, I think, is a collective and continuous proce process of learning and doing, um, and that studying embodied knowledge and know-how explains both uh, habitual and spontaneous interactions. Um, in my own research, I norms that guide sexual behaviors. So it's not that I'm saying we should only look at embodied knowledge and know-how. Of course, there's an interplay between norms and um, embodiment. Um, but I'm hoping that I make clear that the uh, embodiment part is really worth researching as well and explains a lot uh, what's going on in sexual interactions. So I'd like to conclude by saying that it's really necessary to study bodies, embodiment, and sensations, particularly in relation to sex, because if you think about it, it's quite weird that there's so little written about this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mira, for this uh, great presentation and rich findings. Uh, so I want to move on uh, immediately to the next presentation. Uh, who is by Lale Mamudova and Dr. Julia Evolvi. Um, so you can already share your screen. Um, Lale Mamudova has a master uh, in media, culture and society from Erasmus School of History, Culture and Communication. Uh, Lale is currently working for the Erasmus University as an alumni officer. And uh, Lale's research interests include the role of gender and sexuality within marginalized communities. Dr. Julia Evolvi is a lecturer of media and communication at Erasmus University Rotterdam, um, has a PhD in media studies from University of Colorado Boulder in the US. Um, and in 2018, Julia published uh, the very interesting book, uh, Belogging My Religion, Secular, Muslim and Catholic Media Spaces in Europe. Uh, Julia and uh, Lale, the floor is yours now. 
Okay, thank you very much. So I'm glad to present after these three excellent presentations. And today's our talk is called Likes, Comments and Follow Requests, the Instagram User Experiences of Young Muslim Women in the Netherlands. And I'm actually uh, proud to start by saying that this has also been accepted as uh, an article for the Journal of Religion, Media and Digital Culture and uh, is going to be published shortly. So I also put a reference in the last slide in case someone is interested in that. So the whole idea behind this paper uh, is to study the experience of Muslim women in the Netherlands and especially looking at one specific tension. The tension of people, uh, on the one hand, trying to conform to the so-called Dutch and Western values, and therefore showing that they can accept, for instance, uh, the values connected to secularism and, and liberal democracies, but also uh, the scrutiny within the Muslim community and uh, the family context. And this is something that is ex in experience reported by many people that have a, a migration background, but particularly uh, gets uh, enhanced when it comes to women, because gender plays a very big role in here. So on the one hand, Muslim women, especially in the so-called mainstream media representation, tends to not have a lot of agency and be represented as sort of like submitted or even victims of sort of like a patriarchal structure. But on the other hand, uh, often there are expectations that are placed on Muslim women from their own communities of, for instance, appearing modest, and dressing in a particular way, or also, for instance, the dating only with the idea of marriage or uh, re refraining from sexual intercourse before marriage. So there is really this double tension that uh, um, is at the intersection of uh, race, ethnicity, and gender, um, and especially might be felt uh, um, stronger from women that uh, wear veil or another type of modest dressing or head cover. So we have noticed that there is a great corpus of literature looking at how Muslim women uh, use uh, uh, internet platforms such as uh, uh, blogs, uh, YouTube, uh, or Instagram. And often this is shown as an arena where they can so sort of like have their voices heard and uh, uh, also challenge stereotypes about gender and religion. However, we also notice that this tension that I just described is also reproduced online um, because uh, social media can become also a space of surveillance uh, and scrutiny from the community. Um, this is why the research question that we have is how do young Muslim women use Instagram? And we focus specifically on Instagram because this is something that appeals to the younger generation, uh, because it is a platform that uh, offers opportunities for women, especially in terms of businesses and promoting themselves, but also it's highly visual. And there is this neoliberal pressure, so like appearing perfect and especially conforming to certain beauty standards. And therefore, uh, trying to highlight this tension, the sub-question looks at the opportunities and the constraints that Muslim women experience in using Instagram. A couple of theoretical uh, foundations that inspire this study. Um, first, the, the concept of third spaces in post-colonial theory as elaborated by Homi Baba, uh, which is the idea uh, that the culture of the colonizer and the colonized can come together to create a hybrid space of expression and identity and sort of like celebrates uh, the putting together of differences uh, also from the points of view of the colonized. And here it's applied to the fact, of course, that many of the women participating in the study uh, do consider themselves uh, living in between their culture of origin and uh, the Dutch or European culture. But also it has been applied to the digital studies by Rosemary Pennington and other scholars by looking at digital third spaces where different characteristics of religions are um, discussed, but also at sp there are spaces that exist in between between the online and offline experience. And specifically, Pennington applies this framework to study um, young Muslim bloggers in the United States. And then there is the idea of composite habitus that comes from the idea of habitus by Pierre Bourdieu. And is um, applied to the experience of uh, young uh, Muslim women in Copenhagen in Denmark by Karen Walthorpe. 
who talks about composite habitus as sort of like the set of dispositions and background that shapes the practices, the behaviors, the ideologies, and the future of Muslim women. And therefore sort of like uh, helps structuring the way they use the social media and the way they present them online. So really highlights the different constraints and opportunities I was mentioning before. With that, I would like to leave the floor to Lale, who is actually the first author of this paper, and she's the one who designed uh, the study and did the interviews. So she can talk about the results of this study um, much better than I do. So the floor is yours, Lale. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Julia, for the introduction. Um, okay, so to move on to the method, as the topic of the study was very much focused on experiences, it was decided that semi-structured interviews were uh, the best method to go with um, to conduct this research. So due to the corona crisis, uh, the interviews uh, were online um, and also the interviews were held in Dutch. Um, the sample selection for the study uh, focused on self-identified Muslim wo women. However, it did not matter whether these women were hijabis or field or not. Um, the age range that we decided to focus on was between 18 and 27 years old. Um, the women all lived in the Dutch Randstad, which does include the four big cities of Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague and Utrecht, but also does include the smaller suburban areas uh, around those cities. Um, also, all women, of course, did uh, have to be Instagram users. Um, uh, in the end, there were 12 interviewees who participated in this uh, research. Uh, these were all women who were either uh, born in the Netherlands or grew up here, but who did have ethnic backgrounds uh, that were either Moroccan, Egyptian, Turkish, Pakistani, Azerbaijani, uh, and Bosnia. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. <clears throat> so when we look at the results of the study, uh, they can be divided uh, uh, into three categories. And the first category kind of focuses on the uh, cultural uh, identity of the women in the study to understand that just a little bit better before diving into their social media usage. So when um, interviewing the women on their uh, identity, Although their, uh, their ethnicity, their religion, and their nationality played a big role uh, in their upbringing and also their daily life, uh, religion was a lot more often uh, mentioned as uh, a factor that still influences, for example, their day-to-day -day personal decision and decisions in their behavior, such as, uh, for example, choosing not to drink alcohol, choosing to only eat halal food, to dress modestly, to fast during Ramadan. Uh, um, also, religion, uh, again, a lot more often than, for example, ethnicity and nationality was mentioned as uh, kind of an internalized structuring guide to moral behavior, which is not something that's always seen by the public, but more so felt by the respondents. For example, uh, kindness to other people, giving money to charity, or even just having an internalized personal religion uh, uh, or relationship with God. So um, as such, ethnicity and nationality were often celebrated, but more so mentioned as a given. Um, it is just something you happen to be born in uh, with or uh, the country you happen to be born in. However, religion uh, was way more often uh, mentioned as something that is a daily personal and very conscious choice. Um, uh, so yeah, and then uh, also um, with such a diverse uh, identity, uh, most women in this study did find themselves uh, to negotiate between different lifestyles on the daily, depending on where they are, whether this is uh, school, whether this is work, whether this is family spaces. So they did find themselves kind of, kind of putting on different masks, depending on the people that were around them, whether these were all ethnically Western or Dutch people, uh, for example, fellow Moroccans and so on. And although this is something that most women did find uh, as uh, positive and uh, opportunistic because, uh, of course, having uh, yeah, such a diverse background gives you a lot of knowledge of how different cultures and different people work, you know, more languages, you understand more customs. 
However, uh, besides the opportunities that this brings, sometimes it was also experienced as an exhausting survival mechanism. It wasn't necessarily an opportunistic choice they made. It was a way of surviving just by putting on different masks. Um, also, the negative experiences and microaggressions the women uh, experienced because of their cultural identity was uh, almost always uh, experienced by the women who were more visibly different than, let's say, the Western and Dutch norm. So usually that did refer to them having a darker skin color uh, and or them wearing a hijab. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. And there's just a little uh, quote here by Bella who says, your ethnicity doesn't matter whether you're Dutch, Moroccan or Japanese. Um, uh, yeah, that doesn't really matter. But being a part of a societal group that is so big, which is Islam and the Muslims, that is what gives you a sense of fulfillment. So this is just a reference to how ethnicity and nationality are more of a given and um, a religion is is a very much a daily choice with a bigger purpose. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Uh, so the second part of the results is very much focused on the opportunities that the women encountered when using the app. Um, so often Instagram was kind of referred to as this opportunistic uh, yeah, connector. Uh, it gave the women authority over uh, their religious narrative, a uh, narrative that is often uh, quite negative in mainstream media, at least. Um, Instagram is also seen as a, a um, platform that uh, allows a lot of representation for women that look like the interviewees here. And although the interviewees are not necessarily always representing themselves, sometimes they have private profiles, they do feel that people like them are represented and indirectly this allows uh, them opportunities in their daily lives. And examples of such representations are, for example, popular Muslim influencers who successfully combine Islam with Western neoliberal practices such as fashion and makeup. Um, also, Instagram was uh, seen as a place where um, there are a lot of opportunities for business relations and personal relations, and personal relations can mean um, uh, romantic relations or just friendships for with people who have uh, yeah, similar interests, such as you do. And in addition, um, also uh, education religious education, but sometimes also other points of education were mentioned as uh, a result of using Instagram uh, because it did expose uh, the users to accounts that uh, shared types of information that, for example, again, they wouldn't find on mainstream media um, and that really broadened their uh, knowledge. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, so, of course, where there are opportunities, there are also uh, constraints and also the women in the study, uh, even though they very much enjoyed using Instagram, they did uh, face some constraints uh, with the app. So, uh, Julia also mentioned this before, uh, Instagram uh, is uh, an app where also this pressure for perfection is perfect, uh, uh, perpetuated. Um, and this does, uh, with other studies that I read, um, also, um, yeah, uh, is also experienced by other groups in society, so young women in general or young people in general, but there's this pressure for perfection, so the most popular images you will find on the Instagram app will still kind of uh, include um, standard forms of femininity, for example, um, particular beauty standards that are mainstream and often Western, um, and also social class. So the uh, a lot of the popular people on Instagram seem to always be, a, uh, be traveling, have the nicest Chanel bags, and so on. Um, so that is something that when exposed to a lot, some respondents did experience as quite negative towards, for example, their self-image or their mental health. Um, other than that, there's also privacy concerns that come with the app. So some women uh, were very cautious with what they post, sometimes because they didn't want uh, what they post to be screenshotted and shared uh, as evidence to gossip about them. But also sometimes it referred to them uh, not posting pictures in bikinis, even if they wear these on the beach, because they don't trust men on the, inter on the internet. Um, with pictures like that because they can use that for private reasons. So sometimes the women for the, because of these reasons also were very private with uh, their accounts and who they would allow them to follow them. 
And then finally, also surveillance and scrutiny. Uh, so generally, the Muslim female body is uh, surveillanced and scrutinized by their own community and Western society a little bit. And um, a platform such as Instagram does kind of provide a new way of uh, this scrutiny and surveillance. Examples are, for example, um, exposed accounts on Instagram that expose young Muslim women who are participating in immoral uh, behavior. Um, so this is just another constraint that the women experienced and um, yeah, we can move on to the final slide now, which is the conclusion of the study. So the conclusion uh, is that the women uh, that I interviewed um, did uh, encounter new forms of identity exploration and expression on Instagram. This was a very positive experience. Um, the app allowed a lot of authority over uh, their own narratives. Uh, they could challenge negative stereotypes and also spread awareness on um, topics that they found important. However, uh, Instagram was also mentioned as a platform that um, did support damaging self images and also um, allowed Muslim female bodies and also just female bodies in general to be scrutinized and policed in new and easier and modern manners. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and I am looking forward to the question, uh, the questions that are, will be coming, I hope. <laughs> Thank you very much, Julia and Lale. Um, so I think uh, we can start the, the discussion now. Um, I see everybody on my screen. So I'd say if you have a question, you can just raise your hand physically and uh, yeah, then you can ask your question. Um, so while everybody's thinking, I would like to um, ask everyone uh, who is responding to questions to be uh, brief, please, because we don't have a lot of time. We have around uh, 15 minutes maximum, um, I think a little bit less actually, uh, to, to respond to any questions. So yeah, let's uh, give everybody uh, enough time. Um, so I want to ask the, the participants, um, does anybody have any uh, questions? You can also post them in the chat. I can see the chat as well. And otherwise, uh, as you're thinking, I have uh, some questions for the participants, uh, for the presenters. Um, so I thought this connection between Mika's and, uh, and Shangwei's um, presentations was really quite, quite interesting. You both talked about apps and you talked about um, geographies of desire and desirability and affordances that the apps had. Um, there, were, there were two things um, in, in terms of your re, uh, research, Shangwei. I thought um, it was interesting that you were talking about fields and then at one point, correct me if I'm wrong, but you talked about Chinese apps. So um, I was wondering if there are specific apps and if there are uh, for that field, for the Chinese field, what kind of affordances and differences do they have? But there, there are things that are different in terms of the qualities that they offer to the, to the users. And to Nika, I thought it was really striking that your participants themselves um, did not want to mention their age necessarily, and they had a preference not to do that if their apps allowed them. But then, um, I'm assuming because of ageism, but then when it came to choosing uh, uh, their own partners, they wanted to uh, choose them between people who were much younger than themselves. So they chose this 20 years of span uh, who were younger than, than themselves. So I, I wonder how do you how do you go about with this kind of, you know, um, uh, yeah, uh, contrast in, in the behavior. Um, and uh, to, to Mira, I have a question to you about uh, your interviews, uh, Mira. You talked about, um, so I think a lot of the data that you were showing were conversations. Uh, between the partners and you mentioned that you also interviewed people separately so the partners separately and I was wondering if there were any differences or any patterns that came up in individual uh, interviews that you uh, did not um, hear about when the partners were being interviewed together and to Julia and Lale I um, a very interesting research I was wondering when it comes to this form of perfectionism uh, the, the, the perfect image that um, has to be created on Instagram. How does religion come into play there? Um, does does religion have an you know is there an interplay between religion and that notion of uh, perfectionism when it comes to the experience of your participants? Um, so I think we can just go. Uh, whoever wants to start first uh, is, is fine with me. I think I'm going to be very. Oh, sorry. Um, but I can be very brief because um, it was also very striking to me that they didn't want to date older people, but they were then asking other people to date older people. Um, so 
what what their explanation was that they just felt very young themselves and they were very active and then they expected other people um, not to be like that when they were a bit older and they um, actually they were like going on to 60 and they just felt like the 60 was a very big marker of age and that you were almost at retirement age and then it just felt like whole society was telling you to take a step back and take it easy so that's what I felt like that they also felt, um, but they didn't really have um, an explanation of of how they they viewed that. So um, yeah, I still think it's very interesting, and I want to explore it more because it just kept coming back, and then uh, yeah, I want to look more into this. So thank you, Nika. Um, all right, so. Um... So um, as for the question uh, Latin asked about, like the, the uh, in, uh, in, uh, in terms of the affordances of Chinese apps, like what's the difference between the uh, Chinese apps and the Western apps? Uh, well, so um, so in, in this study, so in my study, so dating apps are framed as the size, digital size of sexual field. So they are like, they are what the uh, digital sexual field is anchored to. And um, uh, the Chinese apps, um, so they also have two types. So one type is that one type that doesn't have the match mechanism. So where people can start a conversation with anyone. So the other type is like Tinder. So where they have to um, get a match first. So there are also two types in China of apps in China. But I think the most obvious difference between Chinese and apps and dating apps, no matter what types they are, is that Chinese apps actually have integrated lots of um, features of the mainstream social media platforms like the Chinese apps allow users to post um, their status to post photos uh, to um, so just like you, what you can do on Facebook or Twitter and you can post the things to your followers like photo or text or things like that so there are more user generated content on Chinese apps than on the Western apps so in terms of that I would say that Chinese apps afford um, more allow the users, the gay users to follow, um, to be more aware of what's going on in the gay community because there's more content there. Uh, but, I, um, but speaking of the te te technology or technical th uh, issue, I would say that the Western apps, it's very, very hard to access the Western apps in China. Uh, so for example, you can't find the Western apps on the app stores that are, that are bundled to Chinese smartphones. So for example, if I buy a Huawei in China, you can't find Tinder or Grandr in your Huawei app store. store. You can, and, and uh, also other Chinese smartphones. So you need to install the Google Play first and so where you can find the, uh, the foreign apps. And in order to install Google Play, uh, you, you, need to be, uh, you, you need to know how to use uh, VPN. And the VPN are normally um, limited to the urban Chinese elites who have, for instance, have a, at least the education level of university. So you could say that this group of people who have access to foreign apps, they belong to a higher social economic status. So, so in that sense, you could say that the, the national context actually play a role in the division of the uh, different social groups here. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Shangwei. That was really clear. Maybe I'll answer uh, your question now. Um, thank you for the question about the individual and joint interviews and whether you um, these produce different kinds of data. Um, and that was actually not um, my intention. So I wasn't looking for, oh, the, the partners say this in the, in the joint interviews and I'm going to ask what they actually think in the individual interviews. So um, I'm, I'm using an interactionist and practice theory kind of approach. So I use these joint interviews to really see how partners negotiate uh, sex and sexual norms and sexual sensations in these joint interviews. And then I use individual interviews to follow up on kind of um, what people uh, experience and uh, the kind of embodied experiences they have uh, with their partner with themselves in previous encounters. So it was much more, yeah, I really went, I really uh, discussed the kind of sexual biography of, of, of people during the individual interviews. So in that sense, no, there wasn't, um, um, so yeah, so the topics were different or the focus was different in these two different interviews. 
Uh, but just generally, I did not uh, come across that people were, for instance, uh, more open or less hesitant about discussing their embodied sensations in detail in these two interviews. And I think that also has to do with um, the kind of, uh, yeah, research sample that I, that I got, <laughs> which took me two and a half years to find, because it was really difficult to find partners willing to be interviewed together twice and then also individually. So it was both the time, but also being interviewed together. So I think, yeah, I just, accidentally also selected people who were really willing uh, and open to openly discuss their um, embodied sensations together with their partner. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mira. Uh, yeah, so that leaves uh, me, I think. Um, so uh, to answer your question, um, Ladam, so originally when the women would uh, mention things that were damaging to their self-image uh, such as uh, dominant stereotypes uh, of um, what conventionally attractive people look like uh, this was more of a reference to their let's say physical appearance and um, ethnic identity so their ethnic features which were quite different than what they would see on instagram so uh, however even when there were popular hijabi or muslim influencers that were mentioned that the women liked, these were still very often uh, conventionally beautiful, fair skin and thin women. Um, and of course, uh, that is again, not actually a representation of how the general Muslim uh, female public uh, will look like. Um, so that is actually still, when we look at representation, it is actually still a very uh, small part of representation because it's still yeah, a very beautiful, often well off, uh, yeah, fair skin, thin uh, Muslim uh, woman or a Muslim uh, hijabi woman. Um, and actually, unfortunately, uh, I didn't, I was not able to find uh, uh, interviewees who were, for example, uh, more dark skin uh, or black. Um, I mean, I could find it, but then they were not into Instagram users. So uh, unfortunately, I couldn't go as deep enough into this topic as I would like. But this is something that is, I think, nice uh, for future research to explore because there's a lot uh, more depth where we can go into this with. Yeah. Thank you very much for that uh, answer, Lale. So now I want to invite, uh, invite uh, participants to ask questions from each other, if uh, there are any. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a question for Julia and Lale. Um, because you mentioned the kind of constraints that young Muslim women on Instagram experience. Um, and I was thinking about what kind of strategies do they use to deal with it, deal with this? And you mentioned a few. Um, but I was also thinking before, uh, for, for example, uh, did they create kind of public and non-public accounts, Instagram accounts, so they only have like small group of people. And I was also wondering how did they kind of relate to uh, maybe kind of global community of young Muslim women because they have so diverse backgrounds. Did you have any findings on that as well? Uh, yes, thank you for your question, uh, Mira. So the women uh, never had uh, multiple accounts, so there was always one, um, but uh, quite a few of them had very private accounts. Uh, one of them didn't even post pictures on them, just used the accounts to follow others. Um, and others uh, were just very critical with who they would uh, allow uh, to follow them. They also, quite a few of them, developed the skill of uh, understanding when the follow request was a catfish account, for example. So someone who just wanted to snoop around and someone who was actually a person that they might know that wanted to follow them. Also, very often it was people that they actually genuinely physically knew that they would only allow uh, um, to follow them, but others were just uh, very careful with what they post, uh, but for example, didn't mind having public accounts or didn't mind people being able to look at uh, their pictures, but then they were just a little bit more careful with what um, they would post. Uh, so I think those were the main strategies that I encountered, but multiple accounts uh, that not, I think that is a little bit of a, a, a younger generation even thing, because uh, I have heard about it. Um, and then, um, I'm sorry, I think I forgot your second question. 
I was wondering whether they also use the Instagram accounts to kind of connect to a more global community if that exists of young Muslim women. Yeah, um, so often it wasn't uh, necessarily for connection. It was more often used as like uh, following people who were more famous just as an inspiration source or even a knowledge source. So one of the respondents, for example, uh, would follow an account where um, so she's a Sunni Muslim and she would follow a Shia Muslim account just because she uh, liked to see, because um, also she was exposed to only mainstream media uh, parts of this side of her own religion. So for her, uh, that was just interesting to see the actuality of this part of the religion. And uh, yeah, that was very, uh, for her, a new way of connecting to this other part of uh, other types of Muslims in that sense. But um, yeah, not really more than that, I would say. Thank you. Okay, so I think we can move on to the next question of Nika, and then perhaps we can wrap up uh, uh, the panel. And of course, I think we I can speak for everybody by saying we're all available then to, uh, if you have further questions and want to send emails, of course, uh, that's something you can do after the panel. So Nika? Yes, I had a question for Shangwei um, about, because you interviewed people up to the age of 44, and I was wondering if you saw any difference differences in how they approached the apps or how they felt about it? Um, well, I have to say that most of my interview is that quite young. Um, so I only have one person, I don't have, I, actually I only have one participant who is actually like 44, mm -hmm. uh, if I remember correctly. Um, I don't see the apparent um, uh, patterns there because the data is actually not enough because my data is mainly about young people. Um, but I think um, according to uh, other studies that I have read or people uh, or the young participants that I have talked to, how they describe the older users on dating apps, I think that we, uh, I think there are some differences there. So, so basically we could say that the older queer men in China uh, in general on dating apps, they are more discreet, for example, they probably would never, it's very rare for them to use a face photo in the profile. So many of them like to use uh, landscape, land, landscape uh, photos or um, something similar or like photos of animals, uh, perhaps. Uh, so they're very discreet. And also they don't necessarily have a gay identity because we have, uh, I have to say that the whole, the gay discourse, uh, the LGBT discourse was only introduced into China in late 1990s. So I think people who were born along before that, they don't have this kind of um, the so-called gay identity. Uh, so many of them are more like, um, yeah, it's very hard. I, I just call them queer men, let's say, okay. And so also, I think many of them, the older men that you can find on dating apps, and they also have very different ways of interacting with young, uh, young, younger gay men, because younger gay men have the patterns there. They, they know what kind of words they use for saying hi. Um, uh, for example, they know what's the, uh, the, like how they should ask for each other's information step, step, step by step. But the older men that those younger men uh, they have met. For them, they are more like the outliers there who don't really um, follow any, any uh, 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 clear patterns. Um, so I would say that they are not, um, so in that sense, they are, I would say that they're interactive patterns and how they present, how they prevent, present themselves are very, quite very different from younger Chinese queer men. Yeah, I hope I have answered your question. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much also for the questions. And I think we can bring this panel to a conclusion. But first, I really wanted to thank Ladan uh, for coordinating uh, and presenting and introducing all of us. But also, I'm really grateful that Mira uh, joined our panel and that our panels were merged because I think the presentation was really, really interesting. Um, and in general, I have to say, personally, I really enjoyed uh, all the presentations in this panel and I felt like we had very different perspectives, but at the same time, we could also find similarities uh, between them. So personally, I learned a lot. I hope that was the same for you. And I also wanted to thank the participants that join us uh, despite the technological problems that um, I feel uh, particularly ironic considering that several presentations were talking about the digital media and the internet, but unfortunately uh, are a bit inevitable, especially when you're working on Zoom. 
Uh, but thanks a lot for everybody. Um, I don't know if anybody has any other, any final comment or remarks. I, I just have a very short comment on Mira's study. And um, <laughs> I found it very interesting. I think it's very important to, um, to let's say, to understand uh, sex, sexual pleasure as embodied, um, embodied um, pra practices, um, whatever you call it. Um, because I think when we understand, for example, we understand sexual capital, like sometimes people only think about appearance and body. But I think, I think for some, some people, especially some mm -hmm. of my participants, they also see the intelligence in other people. I think because intelligence also plays a very important role in learning how to please each other, especially in sexual behaviors. So I think for some of my participants, I think they have already noticed that like in their dating practices, that they should not only see the appearance of a person, but also the personalities, whether he's willing to, or, or to like, um, I don't know, for example, to learn how to please his partner or how to, or show respect to, uh, to his partner in, the se in, in sex. I think that's also a very important factor we need to consider when we think about what actually constitutes sexual capital or the desirability of a person. Um, so uh, okay, so that's, that's what I would like to say. And uh, thanks for sharing your study here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very good uh, connection. Thanks for um, closing or to, to bring that, this up in the conclusion. Thank you. Yes. Okay, yeah, so I also would like to thank everybody for the participation and the presentations and the questions and the discussion. Um, and uh, well, best of luck everybody, especially for those of us uh, grading, uh, writing, preparing theses and so forth. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>